Well met everyone, I am Rich DeLich, and in today's video, I'm going to be putting a bunch of video games on screen. I'm on a big video game kick lately. Before we jump into this, let me give you just a little bit of background. So I'm a gamer. There's a lot of gamers out there, right? And one can often say, well, I'm a gamer because I've been playing games for 20 plus years. Let me elaborate a little bit more. Going all the way back to the Atari 2600, I've been gaming since that time, ColecoVision, Intellivision, TurboGrafx, I think up until maybe the Nintendo Switch, no, the, the Wii, something like this. Up until that point, I have had and owned every video game system, for the most part. There may be some esoteric foreign thing that came from somewhere else, but for the most part, I've had every video game system since the Atari 2600. And I went so far as to get a bachelor's degree in video game art and design, and that's just simply to say that I spent quite a bit of money to sit in classrooms over the course of various semesters sitting with professors and game designers and folk that had come in from blizzard and go to various conventions and meetings and conferences and such where all we discussed was why was super metroid considered the pinnacle of level design or why castlevania worked and what made the mario franchise so popular and what was so good about this game or that game so it just put me in a good audience and able to debate, discuss, critique, comment on the games that we loved, but to really break it down sort of in the nuts and bolts, get behind the scenes with those games, just as I did with E3. I went through to Electronic Entertainment Expo back when it was sort of exclusive to those that were either in the industry or pursuing that journey in the industry as sort of a freelance artist and designer, I went to E3 six times. And what that enabled me to do is just be in the room with developers and be among folk that were releasing, you know, companies releasing games that hadn't been released yet, hadn't been shown to the public, that were perhaps a year removed from being shown to the public. So in a way, they were showing people like me and that audience these games so that we can give the designers feedback on what we liked so that they can just simply take a step back cross their arms and just stand and watch and see if any given level or a certain gameplay aspect drew smiles from our face and that constant interaction that feedback back and forth really helped me to build not just a good relationship with gaming as a whole as a fan as a player but also really delving into the behind the scenes of it, of I became enamored with the folk creating it. I knew who the level designers were, I knew who the programmers were. And then also combining that with my education and just my fascination with the gaming industry, I was able to kind of mesh everything together and just get a good understanding on limitations and what polygon counts meant and why a certain game couldn't really push the envelope too far graphically because the gameplay was a certain way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put up a bunch of different video games, one at a time, in no particular order. I'm not going to mention them sort of in genre order, so I'm not going to put the MMOs first and then the action-adventure games first. I'm just going to put up a game, and as I go, I'm going to talk about some things, and specific to the channel and what the goal of this video is, is to talk about the game a little bit, in brief, give an overview on why these games were chosen as sort of an inspiring point for me, a, a, a catalyst in the growth of myself as just a creative individual. Every one of these games have a strong memory and nostalgia component for me, but also many of these games you will see were probably on Game of the Year lists or are possibly considered the greatest games of all time. So what I'd like to highlight here is just talk through how all of these games can help you in your journeys as a dungeon master, as a player, just any creative efforts in the same manner that they helped me. So the first game I want to talk about is Assassin's Creed. The, the game in and of itself, I believe, shows you how important it is to pick a target, and I'm not talking about your target audience, and hit that target. So what is the vibe that you're trying to capture with that game? It was the first game that I remember seeing. Yes, I did the old school Tomb Raider stuff, but where you didn't just have exploration, but that parkour element. 
you know, and it was just done beautifully. I think obviously the, the time period and having the, whether it was motion capture or just the graphic engine and the actual software capabilities to create the style of movement that made us feel like we were actually climbing on these structures and objects was just super well done, right? So to me, that's the epitome, the, the epitome of picking a target of wanting to create this sort of stealthy gameplay, but yet when he needs to, when he's caught, instead of just keeping it sort of a blank, you know, you are either hidden or you're caught, once you're caught or once someone sees you, I should say, you can take off, you know, you can climb, you can get up to different heights. It also gave me just a strong impression of verticality and just showing the world from sort of that top-down view. It made you feel like an epic character because you're standing on that ledge looking down at everyone. And it almost felt like that 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 choice was in your hands of, I'm going to assassinate this guy, but I'm going to decide how I want to do it. So here, Assassin's Creed is just a perfect way of just taking your... If I brought it to the role-playing space, in Dungeon Dragon specifically, 5th edition... Figure out what your target is for the session. Figure out what you're trying to accomplish with that session. If you want to create an epic encounter or a boss fight, have the music complement that. You know, have the the tension. Roll some dice as like a timer and set them aside on the mat on the battle mat, but don't tell your players what they're for. Just create this constant sort of level of tension and just focus on whatever that that goal is, the target. And just make sure everything drives home that point. Anything that goes off of your intended goal for that session, don't include it for that session. Just keep the the, the vibe and the feel, okay? Next up is Baldur's Gate 2. This one has just so much nostalgia for me. You've got Minsk and Boo. And here is just aspects and of layers and depth. I like to think through the way Baldur's Gate sort of did this sort of flowchart or bulleted point thing where... You do the following quest, and the consequences, you know, risk, reward, or should I, I should say success, failure of that quest would now put you in contact with this NPC, and that NPC may direct you to another NPC, and you'd have to travel and explore, and there's possibly random encounters, but then you talk to that NPC, and then that, that NPC gives you a little bit of information about these crypts, and you can now go explore those crypts, or you find out that you probably have to go to some other far-off city to find this ancient library to study some tomes and texts that give you the clues to unlock the doors in those crypts. But it's just the concept of just the way your actions mattered. One decision snowballed into the next. And it's a good way that if you played that game and games like it, that you can sort of go through this almost outline just as you would for the way a lot of authors will sort of outline so they know where their story is going to flow and what it'll do is it'll just create a really deep and compelling story arc that starts to build some consistency and it just has so many layers that the players at your table will kind of think like man when we did that seven sessions ago we did not think that would have a long lasting effect later on you know what i mean it's kind of like the equivalent in video games where when you do something in game and then you come back to that town and the town has changed as a result of the things you've done in game, especially when you can't go backwards, where you have a thing where the choice you make kills off a character in the game and that's it. They're gone. That character's not seen again. You know, it has consequences and the replayability of that in a game like a Baldur's Gate or something like this, where you have that is now it makes you want to finish the game, start over and play it again and make a different decision. So think about how you can wrangle that into the table. The next up is Bioshock Infinite and Bioshock, the two of them. Bioshock, the one where you went underwater into the world of Rapture. Here I'm looking at the, the, the original Bioshock. I'm looking at the atmosphere. So from game design, or I should say within the video game space, we're looking at graphics, right? Yes, sound design has an aspect of that that built, blends into the atmosphere and just the feel you get. But I'm talking about aesthetically. When I first laid eyes on, you know, you go down into that vault, into that shaft, and then you pop out in the bottom, and you're underwater, and just the particle effects, and there's a tunnel I went through where it was spraying water like it was leaking, you know, but just it created an entire world that to us is so foreign because we just as humans obviously don't have that exploration capability underwater. So the atmosphere, the sound design, the sound of the big daddy and that and just the lumbering hulk, you know, wandering through, but yet he's 
preceded by the little sister coming in and has that weird, almost pale, undead look. Like you can tell there's just this pain inside of her. There's just a strong level of atmosphere in that game. Story-wise, it was among the greatest ever. If you have not played Bioshock, go out there and just find it on Steam or wherever you can find it. Play the game. It will... You know, it may be difficult to figure out exactly where and what you can sort of shopping list and pull from it directly into your tabletop role-playing game, but the wheels that it'll start to turn in your head and the ideas, it is the epitome and the pinnacle of story, of building atmosphere and environment and getting someone invested into a newly created world. Those are all aspects that you're going to want to do in your world building and in, at your tabletop game. Next, for the same points, we're looking at Bioshock Infinite. I won't kind of belabor that point any further. It's the same things I just said with Bioshock. So look at those two games. Why sound design, atmospherics, voice acting, character design, story, layers, just everything. Those two games are in my top 10 video games in of all time, period. Next, if you really want to get into the, delve into the atmosphere of a game look at bloodborne right these are the type of games it's like the equivalent of taking your dmg and just beating the shit out of yourself with it right it's just the punishing suffering of the game but there's always that little sense of accomplishment when you spend 15 hours on a boss and you finally get it so it's the bloodborne the demon souls the dark souls the sekiro the games like that the really really difficult ones where you feel like you have one bullet left in your gun and you've got to get through the whole level you're at one last sliver of life and you don't know where the bandages are this works really well for the games that have that sort of Dark Sun-esque feel, right? The really nitty-gritty, down-and-dirty Warhammer-ish, right? Warhammer Fantasy, the original one, you needed a shield. If you didn't have a shield, you were at a massive disadvantage in that game, just as it would be most likely in real life, right? So just really gritty. But the atmosphere, when you look at the game Bloodborne and we look at it from a graphical standpoint, you're seeing just that ambiance, and it's just creating a sense of tension and dread but yet there's also it's not just complete horror dark and gritty that it's off-putting it's also beautiful in a way it, it's just sort of surreal and abstract in a certain sense so think about how your sound design and the music you play when you're explaining a certain ancient crypt you know or an old elven grove or something like this so use the the things that were done well in bloodborne as you play through it and I guess the best thing I can sort of illustrate when I'm talking through all these games is just when you're playing these games, get out there. You know, if you've played them, play them again. If you haven't heard of them, try and find them. When you're playing them, just kind of every once in a while, pause if you're able to and just take a step back and think through where you are creatively and what that's inspiring in you. And I think that's where you can find, you know, the strength of what I'm trying to say in this video. Next up is Dark Age of Camelot. For this one, I get a sense, as an MMO, there's always a strong sense of just exploration and just how large and grand the world is and how small you feel within it. And with Dark Age of Camelot, you also had the three factions. And I like just the diversity and just how different the NPCs were to a certain extent. The monsters in the region, yes, they made sense for the aesthetic, but the way the capital city looked different from Hibernia to Albion to Midgard. And that kind of reminds me of when you go to the elven area in your... D, D game it should feel different than the orcish clan area it should feel different than the human empire you know and and it dark age was a game that kind of almost created three separate cultures and it gave you a different vibe and even the way the players that attached themselves just like in world of warcraft where you choose a faction there was just a general sense of like community but it was yet separate and isolated from that other community especially in camelot because those three groups were at war with each other so think through kind of how that works next up is day sex day sex is a another one similar to assassin's creed i won't kind of go over this too much more where it figured out what its goal and what it was trying to accomplish and it hit it it's very stealthy but it's kind of one of those how do you want to do this you know you don't have to accomplish the task the same way and you can talk to your friend about how you did it, and your friend's going to be like, oh, I passed that mission in a totally different way. I didn't shoot one person. You know, just as you could accomplish that in D&D. Just because a creature is worth experience doesn't mean you need to kill it. Because what it does is it gives the option for the DM to put things against you that are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to kill. And it's his, the DM's way, his or her way of saying, 
you've got to you know conquer this task and overcome this obstacle in a means other than attacking because you're going to tpk otherwise but it shows you know if you accomplish this objective i'm going to give you the exp anyway you know and day sex kind of reminds me of that style dishonored it's the same as day sex and assassin's creed once again it really hit home i think a little more of just the the lethality of that stealth gameplay and sort of the assassination mechanics so that's another really good game to look to divinity 2 for the same reasons as i talked about with baldur's gate 2 just the layers and depth and exploration the voice acting just everything this is regarded right now as one of the greatest sort of that tabletop or excuse me the isometric you know like like Baldur's Gate, right? RPG, single player RPG. Divinity 2 right now is regarded as one of the greatest RPGs in history. That says a lot. You have Dragon Age. Dragon Age, just everything from Bioware within that sense. Dragon Age, Origins, Inquisition, the same vibe as Divinity 2 and Baldur's Gate 2. So for the same things I said and rambled on about Baldur's Gate 2, Divinity 2 and Dragon Age fall in that same boat. In regards to the same things I talk about with Dark Age of Camelot, we also have Elder Scrolls Online. With ESO, we're looking at an MMO again, right? And in an MMO, we are talking about a game that just has so many many layers. That's the, the point of them is you're paying monthly because there's more, you know, there's constant content coming out in expansions. So it's a large game. You know, it isn't a game where you feel like I played 30 hours and I'm done. Okay? So you have just sort of that large scale of just showing how grand your world can be, but specifically to Elder Scrolls Online's credit, the voice acting, the quests, and the layers. So it takes the MMO grand nature of it all and just a large world to explore, and it incorporates those layers of depth like I talked about in Baldur's Gate 2 and Divinity into an MMO. Like that's how good story design is. Another one that deserves honorable mention that's not here on this that I'm going to go through is like the Final Fantasy 14 A Realm Reborn. That's another big MMO that has that feel as well. Next up is this one has, you know, I think it's one of the best, but it just has so much nostalgia for me and that's EverQuest. When I hear this music, The memories, you know, just the friendships I made, the the conversations I had, that they were friends, maybe acquaintances, but just sitting around a table, you know, it's at the same time I was hanging out at a local gaming store playing a lot of Magic the Gathering. People started separating a little bit, and you notice people weren't showing up, and they were just sitting at home, grinding through EverQuest. But it was the first time, you know, I remember in Halas, I think it is, way up north where the barbarians start, and I'm sitting down. And I see a couple of players run by. And it was the first time, other than Quake 2, which was my first sort of online gaming experience, where I was just, wait a minute, that was a real player. And just that interaction with real people. I mean, I've had a friend that married someone that he met in EverQuest, right? Of course, that's not unheard of. So for here, you're talking about just the building of relationships. So in a sense, what EverQuest did can easily be transferred to the table space and how it works in just the fact of just play the damn game, whether you're, I'm talking about EverQuest or d d because just the camaraderie of just sitting with real people and just talking to real human beings just goes such a long way. Yes, of course, I know you're playing with somewhat strangers and you're not meeting these people online, but EverQuest was known for that community where conventions got together where a year later you do meet up at some real world place and meet your guildmates, you know, and I know there's lasting friendships that have been made. People that played EQ together are still playing WoW Classic coming up in two weeks or whatever, right? So that one just sort of captured just the overall feel of taking a bunch of people that share a passion and a hobby and they love seeing dragons and there's magic and doing it all together and kind of grinding through the suffering aspects of EverQuest, but going through it together. You know, I can relate this to me just as a fitness professional, as a CrossFit level one trainer and a coach. The idea of that CrossFit element is you're going through burpees and running and shitty stuff and suffering, but you're doing it with others. So they both motivate you and they also kind of just endure that pain with you and it's a shared experience. And to me, that's what EverQuest provided. God of War. Oh, sorry, real quick on EverQuest. You can find it out there and I believe there's like an emulator. I think it's called Project 99 or whatever. There's folks that have just kept it alive and you can find ways to play that game. God of War. To me, this is the epitome. There's a bunch of layers here. It's one of the greatest games ever made. It's in my top five. And 
I'm talking God of War 1 and 4, really. God of War 1, 2, all of them. Let's just say all of them, okay? But I think for more just the gameplay aspect of just how precise everything felt. The combat felt visceral. It felt strong. It showed that sort of unbridled rage. I think to take that into the D&D space, what I would use for that would be elements of if you're going to have some sort of like a big Viking battleground, you know, or you're going to have some really main epic fight between like the Barbarian King. That I think actually is one of the bosses in the God of War franchise. Just that sort of vibe and feel. You want to create that just that raw lethality of it, right? Play music from the God of War soundtrack, you know, play something, you know, either from Rammstein or just, you know, heavy metal and just play that and just feel that that raw nature of it. And I think God of War just does a good job of showing you what a really lethal, brutal, orcish combat can be like in D&D. Next up is Guild Wars 2. This is the same thing that I talked about with Elder Scrolls Online. Yes, EverQuest is an MMO, but I think EverQuest has a little more of that community. It Yes, all MMOs have a certain aspect to that, but EverQuest was the first to sort of force that in a way, right? Like it was the first time that we all realized... I'm with another human being doing this. Guild Wars 2 has those MMO aspects. It's just larger than life, grand world, exploration, uh, so much to do, but yet you feel like you're the little guy there, right? And in D&D space, uh, an MMO like that, like a Guild Wars 2, I just spilled my water, has a real huge element of, you know, in Dungeons and Dragons, you can have kind of that, keep walking north and you're going to run into giants. I know you're level two. You know, it just shows you that the world is not safe everywhere you go. You know, it's it's bigger than you are right now. Half-Life 2. Top three games of all time. I'm gonna I'm gonna end the the mystery here. Greatest game I've ever played is a tie. I know that doesn't say much, but I have to say a tie because I think it just depends on when you talk to me, where I am in my stage of life, which one I think is better. Is either Shadow of the Colossus. Or Grand Theft Auto V. Okay? Maybe I'll create a video on that if you guys are interested on why. Number two is Skyrim. And number three is Half-Life 2. So there it is. Half-Life 2. It's in my top three video games of all time. And remember my little preamble in the beginning about who I am. What I offer to my contributions in gaming. what, How much I've invested. The time, energy. The years I've played. The amount of games I've played. When something reaches my top three. It's a worthy look. Get out there, find it. You'll notice there's a trend here with big developers. Play every game by Valve, Blizzard, Bethesda, Bioware, CD Projekt. Just play everything by them. Ico. Ico is one that's made by, I believe it's the same companies that did Shadow of the Colossus and The Last Guardian. Those are ones that have almost a subtle excellence to them that maybe you don't notice at first but after you stand back and you finish the game and you put the control down you're like wow that company Ico and the reason why Shadow of the Colossus is tied for my top video game of all, of all time is when I was first playing it first hour or two there was a little bit of that's it this is all I get to do there's a couple of buttons on my PS controller and that's it nothing else is going on but afterwards it is the closest game I've ever played right now to just purely playing art it didn't feel like a game after a while. It was just, it was an experience. And I know that sounds kind of metaphysical and all, that sounds deep, bro. Play the game. Ico is kind of in that same vein. Play it. Next up is Mass Effect 2. Mass Effect 2 goes along the same lines as I talked about with the Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, and Witcher 3. Mass Effect 2 is in the realm of, you know, the writer of that is on par with the best fictional books you know the best books of fantasy and sci-fi fiction that i've ever read okay next up is metal gear solid for the same reasons as mass effect 2 and bioshock and bioshock infinite just yet there's a, a some elements of that dishonored and day sex in there where there's sort of character options and how do you want to go about conquering something and really good stealth mechanics but just layers and layers of just deep story and just up the breath of a single player experience that you know, when you're done with it, you're kind of like, wow, that was like epic. Like you can tell it was, there was a screenwriter involved and an actual writer involved. And you know what I mean? And, and they thought through the scenes as you would like a movie. And I guess that's probably the best way to summarize that. They're cinematic experiences in game form. And if you can create that cinematic experience at a D&D table, you're on the right track. Next up is Overwatch. Just the pure fun and gameplay, but most importantly, level design. 
those maps are designed the way they are for a reason. Like it just flows well with pacing when one team is pushing the payload or one team is trying to hold the checkpoint and the other team is attacking. Yet you have different sight lines that allow Widowmaker to snipe you. And then you have a, a hallway that Reaper can sneak through. Without the right placement of hallways and corridors and doors, your combat loses some of that rhythm and that flow and pacing. And Overwatch does such a good job of just capturing that essence very quickly. And if you can incorporate that into your dungeon design, into your catacombs, when your PCs go down into crypts, when you're putting like terrain mats and gameplay and actually like, you know, dwarven forging it, so to speak, and putting things down on the board, where do you create your walls and where are your sight lines broken in architecture? You know, when you're drawing your map, don't just arbitrarily put a circular you know, a bunch of alcoves for no reason. Yeah, you can always put statues in there and there's various things, but all that stuff makes sense. When you play a game like Overwatch, you start to work through level design. That's a key element in video game design is level design. A lot of times it's unnoticed because unless you're folk like me, people just play it and they don't realize why. But when you notice the pacing just feels like God of War even, right? where you just feel like you're tense, you're tense, you're tense, and you're squeezing and you're hitting buttons and your thumbs are getting white and you're clicking on the mount. And then just when you feel like you're getting a little overwhelmed and it's too much, boom, like the door opens and you just slow down. And you're like, shit. You know what I mean? And I mean, I'm getting excited talking about it. That's optimum pacing. And a lot of that is based on level design because that is how your character navigates through the space. And if you do it poorly, it can feel too big or too rushed. So look at how that works and think through corridors and the architecture of your crypts and your dungeons in D&D. We have next up is Quake 2. This has some of the elements of the nostalgia of EverQuest of just, I can't believe I'm actually shooting against and playing against real players here. But also Quake 2 is the epitome of level design as well. Just the way they're laid out allowed for that real, what is it? I think the soundtrack for Quake, maybe even Quake 2 was Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. The soundtrack of that and that doom feeling of just the vibe of just pace, pace, pace and go, go, go. That's predicated on good level design because otherwise it can feel like you're just running, listening to this upbeat music, but yet you're slogging your way through something. So that's another one to look at for level design. Shadow of the Colossus. I can make my own video on this game alone. It's the same reasons I talked about, about just it's an experience. It's a cinematic experience. It's art. It's just perfection to me. Skyrim will be the same thing. The same reasons as Witcher 3 and even Elder Scrolls Online to a certain extent, the Bioshock. Everything is there. Exploration, story, options. How do you want to do it? I've played Skyrim, went left. Five hours later, I realized I didn't even get Fushroda on my first dragon shout yet. I was just wandering, picking flowers, whatever. Okay, but... It was good enough that it compelled me to wander and pick flowers for five hours. That says something from an overall design level. If that, if you can translate that to the D&D space, that means you've created a compelling world where you don't have to railroad them in order for them to feel like they're doing something exciting. There's just enough exciting bits everywhere. Splinter Cell, this is the same thing as with Thief and day sex and dishonored and stuff like that had just excellent elements of just how do you want to do this and just amazing stealth gameplay so really cool in that regard maybe if you had a real thieves guild campaign or or you want to give like a 20 minute moment for your pc your rogue to shine incorporate some elements from that about how it's not just a blanket you know well roll your stealth opposed by perception did he see you or did he not see you but no there's elements of in these video games like that the splinter cell the day sex the dishonored the thief even if he didn't see you, there's a little meter or an indicator that like something's up, you know? So there's more layers to, it's not just as black and white of you're seen or you're not seen. You know what I mean? There's a lot there. Star Wars Old Republic, for the same reasons as I talked about with Elder Scrolls Online, some of the best voice acting, cut scenes, and story, you know, and dialogue that I've ever played in any video game. So definitely look out and, get, and play that one. And also... As much as I know there's a, you know, I think the expectation of it, because it's Star Wars and a beloved franchise, a lot of people have a strong opinion on it, whether it sucks or not, but there are certain aspects of that game that were done better than any MMO I've ever played. Play through the Imperial Agent storyline and tell me, regardless of your overall opinion of the game as an MMO and whether you want to sub to it or not, because I think you can play through it for free and you can download it for free and play for free, 
play through the Imperial Agent storyline and then tell me that there's nothing of value in that game. StarCraft 2, this is in line with you know, what I was saying with Overwatch or what I was saying in Half-Life 2, in a, a lot of the better games where top to bottom, gameplay, multiple factions, like I said with Dark Age of Camelot, three totally different things. The Zerg, yet it feels there's a balance to it. The Zerg don't feel anything like the Terran who don't feel anything like the Protoss. Your Elves should feel nothing like the Human Empire, which would feel nothing like the Orcs, but yet they're all given equal attention that you don't feel like one is overtly stronger than the other or one is drawing the pcs in where it's like i only want to spend my time with the orc clans because that's the only cool the only cool dudes in the world figure out how to wrangle in multiple factions and give them all a bunch of value super metroid is a game that is just considered the pinnacle of level design game design overall just play through that it's a lot more old school harder to find if nothing else maybe just watch some videos and try and figure out how it works, but I don't think you're going to get that experience without playing through it. There's just something about it that it, it leaves out all the extreme, what is it, extraneous stuff? All the extra bits, all the stuff that doesn't matter, and it just keeps the nuts and bolts of what matters, and the pacing and the flow is just precise and exact. They did that a lot with, you know, the Castlevanias, the Super Metroids, the Zeldas, the Super Mario Brothers. So it was just, there was a precision there. Thief for the same reasons as Splinter Cell or the Assassin's Creed, right? Good ways of just incorporating stealth and elements of that Thieves Guild nefarious to your D&D world. Tomb Raider, that's to me the grand grandmama, really, of exploration, you know, and just that adventurous nature to it. The modern ones are world class. They're excellently, you know, they're amazingly well done. The old ones, of course, they didn't they didn't have the technology to do what Assassin's Creed later did, where it just created a little more of like a a real flow and a rhythm to the movement. But that was where that first part of, you know, you hang off the edge of the cliff. Instead of falling, you have options. You can do the handstand to get back up onto it and whatnot. Also, of course, the strength of just having a female character, you know, as just showing the lead of that. That can go a long way into whether you have female players at your table or not, you know, the NPC, the, the leader of a nation, you know, the strongest warriors, just kind of that real strong female character. So that was a huge step, you know, in, in the right direction for Tomb Raider. Uncharted, for the same reasons as Witcher 3, but, you know, not as deep. It was a little more of a cinematic, real fun movie quality experience than like the real deep kind of multiple layers of Witcher 3, but Uncharted storyline. You know, when you look at the writer of Uncharted, these are writers that can write for movies. You know what I mean? So really, really high-end writing and just top to bottom. It's There's a reason why all of the Uncharted's have been nominated for, you know, 27 Game of the Year awards every year since. Witcher 3, I've already gone over that a bunch of times. It's one of the best games ever made. It's in my top 10 for sure. The 800-pound gorilla, right? World of Warcraft. I can go off on this one forever. WoW has elements of it that are, opinions aside, you know, like or dislike. There's a bunch of things in WoW that I don't care who you are, you can't deny it. You can't deny its impact overall on just the hobby, on gaming space, but just sort of that theme park level of... I can go to the southern jungles and there's something there and it feels like it's the Isle of Giants and prehistoric and there's trolls and dinosaurs. And then I can go all the way up north and there's giants and Viking-like and it's snow and Lich King Arthas vibe. And then I go west and there's Tenaris, you know, or whatever, and there's the desert and there's, you know, the monsters and the flora and fauna fit that. And there's just so many expansions and so much content. I can go into the Firelands where I'm in this hellish landscape and it's all fire and burn and die. And then I can go into the Emerald Dream and find Ysera and there's like elegant natures and druid, you know, druids. And there's so much there. And when you world build in that way, you can definitely pull some things from WoW, okay? Maybe not the fetch 10 wolf pelts for your quest design, but let's move on into the last one. It's letter Z, right? So Zelda. I don't think I meant to do this alphabetically. I think I did because my folder sorted it that way. This video is long enough. If you haven't played Zelda, I'm, I'm going to call you out straight up. If you haven't played at least one of the Zeldas and you call yourself not just a video gamer, okay, just a gamer in general. To me, that is like being a D&D &D guy and a fan and you've never seen Princess Bride. 
you've never seen Lord of the Rings. You've never seen... You can't be a geek or a nerd and have not have played Zelda. Go out, play Zelda. Every one of them every year is always in line to win Game of the Year awards. Ocarina of Time is considered by many, many sources the greatest video game ever made. Breath of the Wild, some people say, is better than that. You know what I mean? Just play the games for many, many reasons. Exploration, but also it just has that that original Zelda, Ganon, and all that stuff. It's kind of where it all started. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can go back to Adventure and the Atari and, you know, Gauntlet and the arcades and whatnot, but Zelda is kind of where it all started. So that's a really long take on a bunch of games, but what did I get? Three, six, eight? It's like almost 30 games there, so it's a lot to cover. I hope it all helped. And I hope, if nothing else, I'll do the best I can to give you these descriptions. I hope you go forward and find these things. Get out there and try them for yourself, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And I promise you, something somewhere will stick. No different than having a good coach or a good teacher or some family member that told you something one day that stuck and inspired you to become a legendary author. Something here will stick, and from it, you'll create greatness. That's all I have for you folks. Thanks everyone for watching, and take care.